Hello, everyone. God wouldn't possibly save everyone from hell because that would violate their free will, right? We'll be covering this half-witted question and more today as we reach episode 8 in our 10-part series, The Consuming Fire, exploring the sizzling topic of hell and the ultimate redemption of humanity in Jesus Christ. Once again, I'd encourage you to watch these videos in order. We've looked at a ton of scripture, but also at how the early church fathers and mothers read and interpreted that scripture. The early Greek-speaking church simply didn't think in the same way as we do. What we call tradition has been influenced by 1,500 years of inferior Latin translations, dualistic mindsets of separation from God, and I've been advocating for a patristic view that the fire of hell is the fire of God's presence and love. That it is not eternal torment, but a refining fire of restoration. But now we must wade into the muddy waters of modern Protestant soteriology. How are we saved? Is it God's choice of who he elects, i.e. Calvinism? Or is it our choice, our decision, our faith, i.e. Arminianism. And both of these, spoiler alert, are non-Christological humanistic ways of thinking. We're going into the deep end today, but I want to make this very understandable. Okay, so I represent, or at least I try to represent John Wesley's view on this topic, which is synergism, synergism, synergism. I'm sort of regretful that the word Arminian has uh has has kind of set in as the word uh for all of this stuff for Wesley I really wish the word synergist would have would have taken uh hold but Arminian is the word we're stuck with so I guess that's what we'll have to go with but you know Calvinist theologians in trying to respond to this belief that view in this uh, non-Calvinist perspective, and that, and this, and the other, would sometimes lump Arminian in as with the view that they didn't agree with, and they meant Pelagianism. But they didn't use that word. They used the word Arminian, um, which is humanistic self-effort, um, no Holy Spirit helping you to obey the Bible, no presence of God in your life. And that's what they thought Arminian was. That's what they, they were really describing Pelagianism, or humanism, right? But they use the word Arminianism to describe that, and it has set in in the Calvinist tradition of theology for centuries. John Wesley brought it out very clearly by studying John Goodwin and Arminius and other people that synergism was the view. And they borrowed it from the Catholic Church. They borrowed it from Aquinas. Synergism is a combination of the influence of the presence of God with human decision and willpower. Synergism is the position of at least John Wesley and the Methodists and the Wesleyans and the Pentecostals. Before we dive in, the theme of our talk ultimately concerns the so-called free will defense of hell. The concept that God will not override our free will, that if someone refuses God, it would be a violation of our freedom for God to save everybody. And this view is popularized by C.S. Lewis, that the doors of hell are locked from the inside. If you're in hell, it's because you want to be there, that you could conceivably resist God for eternity. It's not God's fault. And this is where many hopeful universalists land. And it's sure better than saying God intentionally fries people. And it's where I landed for a number of years before I realized this view was also humanistic, non-gospel rubbish. It's not logical. It's not theological. And it's not an adequate theodicy, meaning it attempts to absolve God of evil by making hell your choice, not his. But if he is incapable of transforming the will of his children, wills that he created to begin with. Children whom he knew before ever creating them would resist him in agony forever. Well, God is still the architect of eternal torment, and your merely hopeful universalism doesn't absolve God of sadism.
So let's break down the role of the human will. You could call the will our desire. And because of its capacity for choice... Okay, so he just accused God of sadism. Okay, what is, what's the word sadism? S-A-D-I-S-M. It means it's a personality trait that involves deriving pleasure from the physical and emotional suffering of others. It can range from enjoying seeing others in pain to actively inflicting pain on others. Sadism's, sadism can be a factor in violent crimes, such as rape, murder, and sexual abuse. Another alternative definition would be that sadism is the tendency to derive pleasure, especially sexual gratification, from inflicting pain, suffering, or humiliation on others, such as BDSM, bondage, uh, sexual sad sadism disorder. So before you start throwing a word like sadism at God, could you at least try to think through that just a little bit more, please? I don't see anywhere in the Bible where it says that God delights punishing people in hell. I see words like vengeance, wrath, anger. Uh, but I don't, I don't see anything along the lines of, man, it makes me happy to see these people frying in hell. No, I don't see that. Perhaps in the words of the great Steve Horn, you could call it our picker. Does God pick us or do we pick him? And this is the dog chasing its own tail in Protestantism to this day. It's the question of election. Who does the choosing? As Karl Barth says, election is the sum of the gospel. It means everything. Now, I came from a Pentecostal charismatic type background, which is very Arminian. If you don't know what an Arminian is, it's probably because you are one. Calvinists know they're Calvinists, and they... Thank you for admitting that, John. If I'm not mistaken, you came from Assembly of God, and you were personally an attendee of Brownsville Revival for some time. And was out of your experience of that, that you... Eventually went to college at University of Georgia, got a journalism degree, and started writing some pretty good charismatic books, and that's how I found out about you. And those were the New Mystics book and uh, Ecstasy of Loving God. I didn't know of anything off-color at that time. Other people like Andrew Strom criticized you that early on. I didn't see anything wrong with you at that point. Now I do. Now I do. There's something seriously wrong here, for sure. Total denial in Scripture and totally just going off into an imaginary, self-visualized world of, of, of universalism that's not even based on visions of God. I love to tell you about it tiresomely. For Arminians, it's all about your decision, your choice, your willpower, case closed. And they will give a courtesy nod to grace, but at the end of the day, salvation is up to you. Yeah. But notice this, John. In Assemblies of God, they have the baptism in the Holy Spirit. People are feeling the presence of God. Let's not rule these aspects out. They think the new birth is about your altar call because they don't even consider the incarnation and resurrection of Jesus, which rebirthed the cosmos. And if you have to choose it, then, buddy, you'd better believe that you can lose it. And so every Sunday was like an AA meeting, drinking five pots of coffee, trying with all your might not to backslide like a white knuckle approach, hanging onto the back of that pew so you don't fall into the flames of Mordor. What's wrong with that? I mean, satirical mocking and journalistic criticisms aside, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with trying to live for the Lord? It's your response, your altar call, revivalism type stuff. Exciting, sure, but anxiety-ridden. Anxiety-ridden, okay. 
Well, that depends on the individual. You don't have to have anxiety if you have peace with God. If you're a rebellious person, right, that's your conscience being convicted. So maybe you were a rebellious person at those times you're referring to. And that's not God's fault. That's not necessarily the preacher's fault. Depends on the preacher. That's your fault. If you're being if you're being rebellious and you're trying to, you know, always edge the line of Christian liberty, well, you've got a problem with the Lord. That's a spiritual problem you have. That's not that's not an indictment against the assemblies of God per se. To choose to be a son of God by your own faith. And it's, it's, it's often this poor translation of John 1.12. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. No, come on, let's read some Greek here. Give in the sense of didomi. Understand how this word is used. It, it is, in case it's, it's like a, a giving to someone of something that already belongs to them. An exousia, the power to be. It has to do with him sanctioning the legitimacy of their sonship. The pistis Christu language in the New Testament is not faith in Christ, but the faith of Christ. We're saved by his fidelity. Human faith is not the surcharge. The gospel doesn't demand faith, it supplies faith. Well, the very next verse here, John 1, 13, we are children of God who are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You didn't pick your mama, your mama had you. You had nothing to do with your natural birth, you have nothing to do with your spiritual birth. You are born from above. And as James says in James 1, 18, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. I mean, Jesus says, you didn't choose me, I chose you. It's extremely clear here. We're, we're saved not by human will, but rather we are born of God's will. And then Paul's epic. Okay, it's both in the Bible. There's, 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 you could create lists of Bible verses for both, of God's action and man's free, free choice response. There's, why do we have to make it out like we have to make this choice? That's monergism, that's Calvinism, and it seems to me that you're so deep into monergism that you've had to justify universalism. Apparently, universalism and Calvinism are both monergistic belief systems. In Ephesians 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to the adoption. Amen to that, dude. Everything you said there was totally orthodox and biblical of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise and glory of his grace wherein he made us accepted in the beloved having made known to us the mystery of his will according to the good pleasure which he has purposed in himself in whom also we have obtained an inheritance you don't earn that being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. Now, I don't see my will in there anywhere. His will, his choice, his grace. It's not that you have no will. Of course, we have a will. We make choices. Uh, but we so romanticize this idea of free will, like Braveheart running through the field. Freedom! There's no freedom outside of God's will. Paul tells us that our wills got hijacked. We why are you spending time going so deep into this, you may ask? Why is he spending so much time going into this concept? I will tell you why. This is what it boils down to. Porn addiction. It boils down to porn addiction. I'd always wondered this. When I was in um, philosophy classes, okay, all these non-Christians and backsliders and atheists would argue against free will. And I'm, and I'm thinking, what's the deal? And I was like, here, here's a pencil, okay? I'm going to prove to you that I have free will. I put the pencil on the table and I said, I am going to move this pencil. Watch. I put my finger out and I moved the pencil and they all watched me do it. See? 
free will. Of course, they weren't persuaded. That was 20 years ago. I know why they weren't persuaded. Because it was the case. It was the case being taken under consideration. You see, my free choice to move the pencil was a weak argument because the issue is not moving a pencil for them. The issue is stop looking at porn and masturbating. Of course, they didn't want to come out and admit that. That's why they say there's no free will. They're addicted to porn. They're addicted to porn. Arminianism says, no, dude. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Put some willpower into it and ask for God to help you along the way. Break off your addictions. And that's the free will argument. Slaves to sin. Your picker was deluded. Too confused to clearly choose God. Sin is at least mental illness that hijacks our choices. You can barely pick between nachos and a corn dog. Did you hear that? Sin is a mental illness that hijacks our choices. Did you hear him say that? Sin is a mental illness that hijacks our choices. He's addicted to porn. He's not coming out and saying it, but he's addicted to porn. That's what he's saying. And he has to rely on an anti-free will theology to support his porn addiction. Movie theater. I mean, this was the whole foundation of the Protestant Reformation. What Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, all the reformers called the idol of the will. Luther, believe it or not, was a synergist. Like Wesley, although Wesley was stronger about it. Luther, at least in the early days, the 1520s, he was synergist because he was coming out of the Catholic Church, the, the Aquinas view. Idea that your will has anything whatsoever to do with salvation. Charles Spurgeon gives us a brilliant statement. He says, I will go as far as Martin Luther in that strong assertion of his where he says, if any man does ascribe of salvation, even the very least to the free will of man, he knows nothing of grace and has not learned Jesus Christ aright. And he was a big cigar smoker and had an eating problem. But I'll let that be as it is. It may seem a harsh sentiment, but he who in his soul believes that man does of his own free will turn to God cannot have been taught of God, for that is one of the first principles taught us when God begins with us, that we have neither will nor power, but that he gives both, that he is the Alpha and Omega in the salvation of men. T.F. Torrance famously said that if even one link in the chain of salvation is left up to us, then the whole chain is as weak as its weakest link. What about every single time the Bible teaches repentance? The word repent means turn. Turn away from sin. God doesn't do the turning. The order in the command is toward the human being. What about every occasion in the Bible where it commands obedience to laws? Okay, That is not a God activity. That is a human activity of will. Okay, Throw salvation right back on our lap. Anything but total grace is the ultimate idolatry of self, of religion. It's the Galatian bewitchment. It's... No, it's not. Because in Revelation 21.8, sorcerers, murderers, and all liars, and all kinds of people like that, are thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So... You choose to be a sorcerer. You choose to be a habitual liar. Right? That's not God choosing that. At that point, if you're going to hold on to God doing everything for us, now you're into the heresy of superlapsarianism and accusing God of forcing damnation on people. That doesn't work. Witchcraft. There's a reason Calvinists get so cocky, because this stuff is as clear as day to them as it should be. So he has been, he has been toying around with hyper-Calvinism. That's what I thought. I, I mean, how do you know you chose hard enough, believed deep enough, repented thoroughly enough? Easy. 
charismatic experiences. Romans 8.16 By this we know that we are the children of God, the testimony of the Spirit, the witness of the Spirit that makes us cry out the Father. That's how we know. That's how we know we're, we've, we're using our willpower to a satisfactory extent, that God's Spirit is actively communicating with us. Etc. It's just not Christological. It's a humanistic view of salvation that never provides assurance. Just Okay, so now you're talking about no presence of God, no voice of God, no dreams of God, no visions of God. Just so we're clear about that, he's talking about people having no charismatic experiences. And, and what a flimsy ground to place my trust in my own conversion experience, my own fickle faith. How do you know you experienced it deep enough? Again, the witness of the Holy Spirit. This is the old Wesleyan teaching on the witness of the Spirit. Romans 8.16. Romans 8.16. Romans 8.16. Let's go to Romans 8.16. And I'll go to the old KJV to give us a classical verbiage here. It says... It says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Romans 8.16 We use our free will up until that point. And we continue to use our free will to keep us there. The Calvinist camp, they pride themselves on being not humanistic. Salvation is all God's choosing. But then they develop this despicable doctrine of double predestination. This idea that at the dawn of time, God had this roulette wheel in the sky, and God is, is, has this random choice, this arbitrary word of who is in and who is out. Uh, you're going to heaven and you're going to hell. Salvation is not up to you, but there's no way of knowing if you have been chosen for paradise or for the deep fryer. Yeah, and that was John Wesley's main concern with Calvinism. I mean, he grew up in a Calvinistic environment and saw a lot of problems with it on that point. And to him, the answer was two things. Number one, emphasize human responsibility in the judgment of sinners. And number two, emphasize charismatic experience of the Holy Spirit to validate your salvation. And so you ended up with holiness Pentecostalism. Mother, when your son is dragged away from you in chains to the bowels of Hades, you will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, for his ways are higher than our ways. For the Calvinist, Jesus just died for the elect, for the chosen. In fact, he hates the other guys. He hates the reprobate. And the Calvinists are ignoring these vast swaths of scripture, such as, for God so loved the world, and if one died for all, then all died, and God, quote, wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth? Yes. You, you could be a Wesleyan if we were to just take that section out, John, and put that into an Arminian Wesleyan evangelistic campaign. John Wesley preached the same thing, Okay. But all these all, all, alls is not salvation from hell once you get there. The all, all, alls are the gospel is available to Jews and Gentiles, all races. For the Arminian, God is at least nice. He wants everybody to be saved. He's just incapable. It's up to your choice. No. No, 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 no. John Wesley says everybody wants people to be saved. But it is their responsibility to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And behind the scenes, invisibly, sometimes the voice of God, the presence of God, or converting dreams might come along to assist people in their free choice response to the gospel. For the Calvinists, God is capable. His will is what saves us, not our own. But he doesn't want to save everybody. He's primarily a God of sovereign power, not unconditional love. 
But backing this up to our reading of Ephesians 1 here, Paul didn't say you are chosen. He didn't say you are predestined. He didn't say you are elect. He says you're chosen in him, predestined in him, elect in him. We've taken off the in him part. And this was the genius of Karl Barth who changed the theological landscape in the 20th century, bringing everything back to Christology, back to the early vision of the fathers like Athanasius, Gregory of Nyssa, St. Hilary. See, God wasn't choosing one guy over another guy. God chose himself. Jesus Christ is the choosing God, the electing God, and the chosen man. The elect man. He is the last Adam who vicariously represents the entirety of the Adamic race. I decided to tackle Protestantism's biggest conundrum with the shortest book that I've ever written, Chosen for Paradise. Pick it up. This is a shameless commercial. Uh, if you are still not convinced on how important this stuff is, I understand. Nobody wants to read a book on election. Well, so just to give it some sex appeal, I put naked people on the cover. And if you're thinking, John, I can't have that in my household, that cover's going to make me stumble. Well, remember, those are your grandparents, you weirdo. So put some duct tape on it and just get over it. Okay. I don't want to get over it. Because even though you put something quasi-pornographic on there, it kind of suggests to me that you might be on Pornhub. So, you know, it's not really a good testimony, John. God did not have a big lotto wheel in the sky to decide who's in and who's out. What if he did not have a random arbitrary word? Uh, what if God had one word, has one word, always will have one word, and that word is Jesus Christ? The problem is we have not looked at election through a Christological lens. Christology gets sat on the back shelf as this irrelevant thing. You know, Jesus is just a footnote in this whole story about fallen Adam. And, and while we either run some irrelevant hamster wheel trying to work ourselves into heaven or drum up some mediocre list of good works to prove that we are the elect of God, included in his Calvinistic limited atonement, that we are recipients of irresistible grace, both sides leave you wondering, am I really saved? And there is only one proof, and one proof only of your salvation. It has nothing whatsoever to do with you. That proof is love hanging on a tree. In fact, salvation is not a transaction. Salvation is a person. Look, all of the Bible is full of election. You have Adam, God's chosen man who represented all of humanity. You have Noah, the eight in the ark. I would like to plug a couple books by Kenneth J. Collins from Asbury Theological Seminary. I understand that Asbury Theological Seminary is a hodgepodge of different points of view. It differs little than a public state university, honestly. There's liberals, there's conservatives. It's, it's a mixture of weird theological views. But... In my opinion, Dr. Kenneth J. Collins is a faithful interpreter of John Wesley, and he doesn't put his own spin on it. He just represents John Wesley. <clears throat> so I recommend you take a look at his three books, uh, Wesley on Salvation, <clears throat> which had a deep impact on me, Wesley on Salvation by Kenneth J. Collins, uh, the Scripture Way of Salvation by Kenneth J. Collins, and then a third book which I have not read yet, but which is more thorough. It's called The Theology of John Wesley by Kenneth J. Collins. Uh, I'm going to plug those three books. Please buy those three books because that represents John Wesley's views on uh, uh, free will and grace. And of course, I also would like to plug John Wesley's Scriptural Christianity by Thomas C. Oden. And also, John Wesley's Teachings by Thomas C. Oden. That will probably faithfully represent John Wesley's views on grace and free will. Populate and represent 
all of humanity. You have God's chosen guy, Abraham. And from his loins, Isaac is chosen over Ishmael. You have Jacob chosen over Esau. You even have God's chosen people, Israel. But right here is where we begin to get it drastically wrong. We think Israel was chosen apart from the nations. But Genesis 12 says you will be a light to the nations. Israel was not for herself alone. Her destiny was to point all humanity toward God. Now, Israel obviously failed in her purpose, but God never failed in his. Even within the history of Israel, there was a continual narrowing down through wars, captivities, and exiles with remnant upon remnant throughout the centuries, a constant sifting down and sifting down until finally someone emerges on the scene. Jesus Christ appears in the fullness of time as the one true Israelite, the one man who represents all of Israel and therefore the one true light to all the nations. Just like Israel, he goes down to Egypt in Matthew 2. Just like Israel, he comes up through the waters, Matthew chapter 3. Just like Israel, he goes into the desert for temptation, Matthew 4. And just like Israel, God gives the law through him, Matthew 5 through 7. Throughout the book of Matthew, you see Jesus emerging as the one true Israelite, therefore the one true elect chosen one to all nations. See, it is one thing to believe that Jesus died as a man. It is a whole nother level to believe Jesus died as mankind. Romans 5.18 Consequently, just as one trespass in Adam resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act in Jesus Christ resulted in justification and life for all people. Same all here. Same all in Adam, same all in Christ. Paul was literally standing outside himself in ecstasy in 2 Corinthians 5.13 because he had realized, verse 15, that if one die for all, then all had died to sin. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 and 22. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Universal salvation is not some metaphysical necessity, some abstract rule to which God is obliged. Okay, universalism is a Christological reality because Jesus Christ is the Savior of the cosmos. For God was in... Universalism is not reality. If you are shaping your view of the world based on the Bible... Universalism is an imaginative, imagination-based concept on people who were uncomfortable with the doctrine of eternal punishment as it appears in the Bible and wanted to go off in their own direction. Christ reconciling the cosmos to himself. Now, Calvinists, they are going to appeal to Romans 9 through 11, which this book addresses uh, God hardening some you got vessels of honor vessels of dishonor God hating Esau all of that kind of stuff God doesn't hate anybody he hates what Esau typologically represents the false sinful self something we covered in episode 5 and we'll pick up again next week in episode 9 look Romans 9 through 11 mentions nothing about hell and the kicker, it says here that God's patient bearing with the vessels of wrath was to an expected end. Eternity does not have an expected end. Most of the time when the Apostle Paul refers to hell, he uses the word wrath. W-R-A-T-H. I think it's Romans 5. He says that we're saved from wrath. That's just his way of expressing um, his view about hell. And I'm glad that he did, because if he didn't, people would be locked into this concept that all God is is a sadistic torturer of people in hell. Right? Wrath communicates the reason behind hell. Wrath communicates that he is a angry judge of wicked sinners who are rebellious against his laws. All of that comes from the concept of wrath. 
and the concept of sadistic torture is balanced out by justice and vengeance of a holy God. Eternity, as Bart says, as the boundary of time, is the end of time. Some people may have played the role of chamber pot in this life, but this is not their eternal destiny. And Romans 9 through 11 rightly tells us it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. Salvation is not about our will, but God's choice. But these three chapters are actually one long, involved dialogue that eventually puts Moses and Pharaoh, Jacob and Esau, Isaac and Ishmael, all on the same plane, Jew and Gentile. It culminates with Romans 11.32, God has handed all men over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on all. This is actually one of Paul's most inclusive, universal passages. Here we go again with the all verses. As if this meant that everybody who goes to hell will certainly be saved out of it again. Oh yeah, let's just take every verse in the Bible, in the New Testament, that has a double L in it. And that means that when people burn in fire, like the guy in Luke 16 that someday an angel's going to yank their arm up out of hell. I mean, this is what you do, John. This would not stand up in a court of law. There's got to be more imagery here. Where's the evidence that that's going on? There is none. Entire writings. So, just to recap, Calvinism says God can save all, but he won't. Arminianism says God wants to save all, but he can't. The only logical conclusion is a Christological and universal one, that God wants to, he can, and therefore he does and did save all. We read in Romans 9.15, For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Namely, those who repent and believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, Mark 1.15. Now, because we've looked at these passages with a bass awkward Calvinistic lens, we think of this as the indeterminacy of God's mercy. What we hear is, I will curse who I will curse. But that's not what he says here. This is about the solid intensity of his mercy. He will curse those who are impenitent and refuse to trust the gospel. I can bless whoever I want, even the Gentiles. That's the point. Of no, God, God will not bless, as I've said many times before, for rhetorical purposes. A biker who kidnaps, rapes, and molests women and children and then puts their bodies on an altar for satanic ritual abuse. He will not bless such a person, John. Instead, he will cast them into the lake of fire and brimstone. In Revelation 21.8. All of humanity grafted into the fat Jewish olive root. And even the broken branches grafted back in again. Because Paul says in this passage, all of Israel will be saved. Paul is quoting <clears throat> Exodus 33 in relation to Moses seeing God's glory. John, think about this during this Halloween season. This line of thinking leads to saying stupid things like this. Of course Hitler will be saved, as you said in a previous video. I, I can't remember where. Of course child, unrepentant child molesters and sa satanic devil worshippers will be saved. When are you going to say that? As it reads, it says, And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he says, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. See, we needed to be crucified with Christ in his own death in order to see God's glory covered in the rock, which is him. And that's exactly what happened to the human race. The plan of the eternal gospel 
is that all humanity would be woven into the fabric of Jesus' existence. God has chosen not to be God apart from humanity. Jesus' coming was not plan B. The incarnation was his eternal purpose behind all of history and creation. In his divine humanity, he attacked and invaded our side of the covenant relationship. So now we can finally begin speaking intelligibly about the free will defense of hell. The idea that God would not violate or coerce our freedom. Let's be a little bit more clear. It's not an idea. It's biblical revelation. It is revelation from the Holy Spirit, canonized in the scriptures, that God's Holy Spirit universally influences the world through the conscience, then leads them to the Ten Commandments, then leads them to the atoning sacrifice of Jesus, and then the people who want it, who want regeneration, who want to respond to that gracious influence, turn away from their sins the best of their ability with the help of the Holy Spirit influencing their minds and hearts, and they become born again. That is a revelation, not an idea. That is a revelation of the Bible. It's all over the Bible. Someone could conceivably reject God forever. I love the line in the old Christmas hymn, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, that goes, Hearts unfold like flowers before thee, opening to the sun above. There is such a profound theological depth that underlies this beautiful simplicity. Can a flower not open to the warmth and light of the sun? Can it ultimately resist the very logos of its design? Yes, some flowers do resist the sun because they are defective and deformed flowers. It happens, while most of the other ones do open to it. That's good. The very light of the sun that liberates our will, that frees our will. Grace is irresistible, not that it coerces. Or okay, so we're buying from, borrowing from hyper-Calvinism to be a universalist in this point. He just said grace is irresistible. Lie. Lie. Acts 7.51, I think it is. You always resist the Holy Spirit, Stephen said to the Pharisees but that it illuminates us to see that Christ is the true and ultimate fulfillment of all our longings. He is the desire of all nations. So, does God honor man's choice for eternal destruction? Uh, we are not even remotely asking the right questions. So, He's a holy judge. Yes. Yes, just like every drug dealer makes a choice to deal drugs, kidnap, rape, and kill, so also the judge makes the choice to condemn them to capital punishment and death row. Yes, choices are very, very bad choices in those cases are going on. Reframe this, shall we? Does God honor the bondage of our will to the slave master of sin and its inability to choose him? Okay, porn addiction. I smell porn addiction, okay? It is possible to break off addictions to alcoholism, to porn, to drugs. Teen Challenge will tell you that. John, stop being addicted. Or does he pursue us to the links of his own violent death in order to liberate our will into actually becoming a freed will? Amen. And, you know, you'll find Arminian theologians saying freed will with the D at the end. Yeah, because the Holy Spirit's freeing up your will to be holy. In other words, breaking off addictions. But sin... Our will never had a truly libertarian freedom that was capable of objectively making a clear decision for God on our own. Well, now we're just talking in circles here. Where's the Bible verses for this? I mean, every, like I said before, every time human beings are ordered to repent or obey the law of God in the Bible implies, choose ye this day whom you will serve. 
to serve whether God or, or, or the gods of the Ammonites. Our picker was deluded, even to assume Adam had a perfect revelation of God. What did Eve do at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? She chose to listen to the devil and eat the fruit, and then God punished her for it. Prior to the fall is to ridiculously assume that Adam didn't need the advent, the incarnation of Jesus Christ, to show him what God is really like. I mean, it's actually an antichrist idea. It is ultimately God himself who liberates our will and frees us from the mental illness of our deranged condition, a condition he heals but did not cause. Our so-called free will alone is incapable of choosing God. Rather, Jesus is the one who enables a freed will response. So for those who object to God interfering with our will, with this argument that, you know, well, you're not a robot, this kind of automatron argument that if we don't make our own decisions, then we're just robots. All right, fine. But is God just playing a game of principle here where he's willing to destroy you in order to preserve the dignity of your so-called free will? Look on this blasphemous. When we see his beauty as he truly is. There's no dignity involved in lashing people with fire in hell, unless we're talking about the dignity of justice with a capital J. And who are the people being lashed with fire, John? Evil people. Revelation 21, 8, Luke 16. Evil people. If we go to a dictionary definition of the word evil, it means in t a desire to intentionally inflict harm upon other people. A desire to intentionally inflict harm on other people. Without the blinders of sin, death, and the world, we cannot resist being moved, just as, as one would be moved by a piece of breathtaking art or music. Where does that come from? Is that even an act of the will? Or is that beauty, truth, goodness liberating our will? See, the universalism that I'm appealing to is not the product of some metaphysical necessity, some impersonal Aristotelian causal logic to which God himself is bound to obey. He just has to save everybody. Uh, this is a necessity because it's rooted in Christology alone. True Christian universalism is not some pie-in-the-sky-ism to which God must bow. It is dependent not on some abstract decree, but by the incarnation, death, and resurrection of Jesus in the love of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As Dr. Alaria Romelli observes, she says, and it clearly emerges that for Gregory of Nyssa, just as for Origen, the doctrine of apocatastasis, the restoration of all things, is a Christological and indeed Christocentrical doctrine. In their view, it is a specifically Christian doctrine. No, universalism is a pseudo-Christian imaginative fantasy system. This is also why Origen was at such pains to distinguish his own Christian notion of apocatastasis from the Stoic, from the philosophers. Both in Origen's and in Gregory's view, universal apocatastasis is made possible, not by any metaphysical or cosmological necessity, but by Christ's inhumanation, his sacrifice, his resurrection, and by the grace of God. The very fact that for both Origen and Gregory, the eventual universal restoration begins with and coincides with a holistic vision of the resurrection makes it clear that their concept of apocatastasis is thoroughly Christian, given the Christian, not pagan, not platonic roots of the doctrine of the resurrection. Wrong. Apocatastasis is thoroughly Gnostic. Uh, Jurgen Moltmann says the true Christian foundation for the hope of universal salvation is the theology of the cross and the realistic consequence of the theology of the cross can only be the restoration of all things. St. Maximus the Confessor 
with many of the fathers, grounds this liberation of our will, our choice, our desire within Christ's own vicarious bending of humanity's corporate will back to the Father through the incarnation and passion. I mean, think Garden of Gethsemane, right? This he's done for and as all humanity. And the Spirit now turns the light on for us subjectively, personally, individually, to each of us by spotlighting Jesus. For to see him is to be like him. Maximus, you may remember, had his hand chopped off and his tongue ripped out. So Amen. Amen. To see Jesus is to like him, is to become like him, and to like him. <laughs> I agree with that, you know. Looking unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, the number one contemplative Bible verse in the, all the Holy Bible. Um, we with unveiled face, changing from glory to glory. Another top-notch contemplative prayer Bible verse. Right, and he couldn't preach. What the authorities didn't like and what yet eventually was affirmed as church-wide truth and doctrine in an ecumenical council was Maximus' teaching that Jesus Christ had not one but two wills, a human and a divine will. Jesus has taken on our deluded picker, and by living in it, in a life of holiness... And yet he was without sin, the Bible says. Let's remember that and purity from within it. He has realigned our will into harmony with the Father. This is the vicarious objective truth for all of us. And the salvation is never thrown back upon my lap, my will, my feeble human decision making. Furthermore, putting any salvific weight on our human choice, it, it's already been deemed a heresy, the heresy of Pelagianism i.e. self-salvation. Amen. John Wesley would say, Amen, 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 Amen. John Wesley would disagree with Charles Finney when he expressed Pelagian views. Although Charles Finney was not fully, uh, I'm finding the more I record Charles Finney, he was not fully consistent on this point. Because he oftentimes um, would talk about the influence of the Holy Spirit. The problem with uh, his Pelagian expressions was rooted in him trying to trying to um, get people to repent because they would come up with these lame Westminster Confession interpretations that they didn't need to repent. And so he ended up with these Pelagian sort of expressions to try to say, stop it. You know, you're being ridiculous. God's going to judge your life, so repent. You know, and then he would say, this whole sinful nature thing is just ridiculous. Just repent, you lazy Christians. You know, that's that's where Charles Finney went up, went wrong. When he, when he did that stuff, but um, John Wesley and the Methodists never, never got into that. They were like, no, repent you lazy Christian and ask for the witness of the Spirit. They would always, they would always do that. That was the Methodist difference between Finney who got into what I would call semi-Pelagianism because he still required the influence of the Holy Spirit. And at times, there are, there are moments in Finney's sermons where he actually preaches against the sinful nature. So he was he was confused on this topic um, and seemed to waffle on the topic over the course of his life. But Wesley never did. <clears throat> Wesley wrote an entire book and an entire sermon on original sin. And <clears throat> since I brought a critique of St. Augustine last week, it behooves me to now give him a little credit in saying this is one area where Augustine does shine in one of his biggest positive contributions to the church. His rejection of Pelagius' belief that we are saved by our choice rather than sheer grace. Dr. Scott Sullivan writes, The modern pop apologetic for hell, a.k.a. the free will defense, with the argument that God cannot force people to choose him, not only undermines the traditional understanding of divine omnipotence, but also contradicts the classical doctrines of grace, predestination, and free will. 
We are about 10 days away from Reformation Day, and I want to say this as a representative of John Wesley, although he might roll his eyes at me expressing it this way, I fart upon all theology that portrays God as forcing people to repent and believe against their own will. That is completely, completely ridiculous and completely obscures the justice of God and the damnation of sinners. And Jonathan Edwards didn't believe in anything like that. Jonathan Edwards, believe it or not, was a synergist, if you really get down into his sermons. Ultimately reduces to a Pelagian heresy. That's why this lame apologetic was rejected by both Augustine and Aquinas. So, <clears throat> Pardon me. So for folks who are perhaps hopeful universalists, as I once was, who perhaps see the flaws of Arminianism and Calvinism, but you still hold out the possibility that someone could resist God forever, well, your reluctance here is just a jump right back to Arminianism, to Pelagianism, to the human will and human reception of God being the salvific factor. If it might not be too onerous to bear, might I suggest that you could have departed from Christology? See, some recognize the objective unity of Christ with all of humanity, and not everyone, obviously, has subjectively realized their union with Him. There are plenty of unbelievers, right? But the only truth is the objective truth. See, once you start splitting this up and put a dualism in this union, that people are positionally united to God, but not really until they believe, well, not only have you made union pie in the sky, but you're bifurcating the very hypostatic union and negating the omnipotence of God. Of course, faith is our participation in this union, but it is ultimately God, by sheer grace, who even enables us to believe. Yes, that's called revelation, and you get it in many ways. Dreams, visions, voices, impressions, signs. Know that you know, intuition. That's the God part of faith. The man part of faith is holding on, holding on with your free will, holding on to your faith after the experience. That's why there's all these exhortations in the New Testament. I have fought the good fight of faith. I have run the race. This is no more a question of God violating our will. It is a question of God liberating our will at an individual level by grace, as only he can, as he did for every believer, and already objectively has in the vicarious humanity of Christ. No one came to faith as an act of their own human volition. Last time I checked, faith is still a gift. If we're afraid that this makes salvation uh, some impersonal blanket fiat that just makes us puppets, no, God absolutely personalizes this salvation to each of us. This personalizing person, Jesus Christ, uh, intimately individuates this relationship to each and every one of us. But we need to stay consistent here. You know, <clears throat> as I quoted David Bentley Hart in a previous episode, he says it makes no more sense then to say that God allows creatures to damn themselves out of his love for them or out of his respect for their freedom. Yeah, no, that's, that's twisted and weird. I don't see anything like that in Scripture. Um, creatures damn themselves because they're rebellious against uh, the laws that say, have no other gods before me, make unto yourself no graven image, uh, don't honor uh, godly parents, uh, don't murder, don't ki kill, don't steal, don't commit adultery, don't be a porno watcher, don't be a drug dealer. That's implied in that. Uh, don't kill. Don't be covetous. Did I list, uh, don't be bury false testimony against your neighbor. See, they, they figure these things are too constrictive. So, well, I'm going to live my own way. I'm going to move to Miami and, and, and have threesomes, you know, and not read the Bible. That's the issue. 
That's the issue. And then when they die, they go to hell under the wrath of a holy God. What's so hard to what's so hard about that? I mean th th this is this is not hard. We're obscuring it through philosophy and imagination here. This is not hard to figure out. A father might reasonably allow his deranged child to thrust her face in a fire out of a tender regard for her moral autonomy. The Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world, not the sin of the women who women who of their own free choice moved to Miami or to Los Angeles to get involved in the porn industry not because they were kidnapped not because they were recruited by some mafia person but because they actively sought it out God doesn't look at these poor women these poor in sexually enslaved women as well you know I love them so much that I'm just gonna let them become porn stars I love them so much that I'm going to honor their free will to become porn stars. That's not the feeling at all. God's grieved. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. It's like, what are you doing? That's more, that's more what the Bible says about that. The willing, the lucky. Not every person is experiencing this liberation because in part, not every eye sees him clearly, including our own. Not to mention, most have only heard a dodgy gospel, not based on Christ, but upon all sorts of religious transactionalism, a so-called gospel they should reject. But as Hart says, to see the good. The gospel is that if you will turn away from your sins against the Ten Commandments in thought, word, and deed, and turn towards obedience to them, and put your faith in the substitutionary sacrifice and blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, turning that wrath of God away, being saved from wrath, being filled with the Holy Spirit, hopefully maybe speaking in tongues, although that part's not necessary, but you have to have some sort of Holy Spirit experience to validate your faith. Having a desire for righteousness, having a desire to crack open the Bible and obey it and learn it. That's the gospel. Truly is to desire it insatiably. Not to desire it is not to have known it, and so never to have been free to choose it. From Scripture, we do know that every eye will see, which most likely is why Scripture says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Perhaps unbeknownst to them, Jesus Christ is the desire of all nations. The apocalyptic inbreaking of Christ invades every nook and cranny of existence, including the hearts of men, of whom he is already the ground of their very being. In him all things hold together. Now, <clears throat> does this absolve us from passing through fire? indeed tremble because everything will be tested by his all-consuming fire it's a weird feeling weird weird concept dude total weird where's this in the bible apparently john is getting this from either gregory of nyssa or origin or somebody like that in order to be a universalist you have to like john crowder he literally believes everybody that god ever created is going to burn in the hell in hellfire That only might last a couple minutes or so. And then you will come out entirely sanctified and ready for heaven. It's like taking a bath. It will be very, very painful. Weird. Weird. Total imagination. Total ima totally imaginative. Has no concept of the justice and wrath of God. It's just weird. It's just pure, pure weird. A painful bath for everybody, then they all go to heaven. Where is this in the Bible? Where? It's twisting of scriptures. It's all it is. As we've argued, God himself is the fire of hell. But this fire is his very loving presence that burnt. No, 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 no. The fire of hell is not a loving presence of God. It is an angry presence of God. Second Thessalonians 1.9 is all you need for that.
He will destroy them with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. And I think a couple verses before or after talks about the vengeance of God. I mean, it's, there's no love of God in hell. There's pure hatred and holy revenge against sin cancer, cauterizing and healing the disease of sin, purifying humanity from... No, 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 no. There is no healing of sin in hell. It is eternal destruction. That's it. Because it is eternal punishment. That's it. From every resistance to love, waking us up to the fact that we're already free from sin in Christ. And who can stand when he appears? What is destroyed is the illusory false self of our own fabrication that never had its origin in God, our own false incarnation. This should give us the most exhilarating hope. Correct me if I'm wrong, there's absolutely no Bible verses that talks about a true self and a false self. Okay. The terminology, the language that's used in Scripture talks about a fallen humanity having to be redeemed to holiness through the regeneration activity of repentance. Mingled with heart-pounding reverent trepidation. This is true hellfire preaching. No one escapes it. Not even you who raised your hand or made a decision, for God's love is inescapable. That is completely a lie. You don't believe any of this stuff. You don't, you don't believe in the supernatural. You're, you're, you're a false prophet, John. You are acting as a false prophet and as a false teacher, and you should feel utterly convicted. But as Origen says, if all the factors that St. Paul listed in Romans 8 that cannot separate us from God's love, still less shall our free will be able to separate us from God's love. George MacDonald writes, but there is a light that goes deeper than the will, a light that lights up the darkness behind it. That light can change your will, can make it truly yours and not another's, not the shadows. Into the created can pour itself the creating will and so redeem it. This is the deeper flame that transforms the human will. Maximus draws a distinction between our God-given natural will, as we're made in the divine image, with an innate capacity and desire for God, versus what he calls the gnomic will, from the word gnosis, knowledge. The gnomic will is a twist. It's a perversion. You Are you... A believer in gnomes, John? We call it the deliberative will. Did God say? You know, the, it questions the good. And it's what we might loosely call the sinful nature. It's not an actual thing. It's based on delusion. What we desire is the good. But in our delusion, we conflate good with evil. And this judo move gets pulled on our natural God-given will to do something that's contrary to our design. Even the most evil of evil persons pursues the good. Even if it is a misguided, radically misguided notion of what they think will be good. Even if it's just good for themselves. The will is not free if it is ill-informed. If it is clouded with a lifetime of environmental trauma and the miseducation of this world, our choice is simply clouded with confusion. I mean, how many of you guys have agreed to some 400-page electronic user agreement just to use your new smartphone without even realizing you signed away your rights, your privacy, your firstborn child? We don't even know what we're doing. As Hart says, quote, you cannot reject God except defectively by having failed to recognize him as the primordial object of your deepest longings, the very source of their activity. Now, of course, Maximus asserts, we must indeed say yes to Jesus Christ. There's no relationship with God apart from Jesus Christ because 
Jesus is God. Of course we must say yes to Jesus. But Maximus asked whether when we see him as he truly is, without the blinders of sin, without the blinders of the flesh, the devil, without the twist or perversion of the gnomic will getting in the way, would anyone truly reject him? And this is what the purifying love of God illuminates. The inclusion of all humanity in the last Adam is the non-negotiable gospel fact. You didn't choose to be in Adam. You don't choose to be in Christ. Nevertheless, in Christ. You don't choose to be in Christ. What? What? No. Choosing to serve the Lord is in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Remember what Joshua said. Choose ye this day whom ye shall serve. Whether it shall be the Lord or the gods of the Ammonites. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that is an assumed concept all throughout the New Testament. Repent and believe in the gospel assumes choosing to stop sinning in a sinful lifestyle. Not perfectionistically, but the best you can. And God will help you along the way. Your will is actually liberated in order to participate in true freedom, responding to your deepest God-given desires. Sin only enslaves and perverts the desires, never allowing them to come to their full fruition. It's digging through the couch cushions, searching for another fix that will never satisfy. There is a flame deeper than our will that transforms it. If our human will is already objectively healed in Christ, well, why don't we see it? Why isn't everyone making perfect decisions yet? Well, why, why don't we see everyone physically healed yet? Why don't we see wars ended yet? Because synergism accounts for that. Synergism accounts for that. See, the presence of God is an influence on, on us. We don't feel it most of the time, but sometimes we do. We can journal it, and we can look back on the miracles of the Lord in our lives, and it can help us to remember those times. Dreams, visions, same category. Voices, these are things we can journal. We can look back on them. They're not continuous experiences. So what do you do in the dark moments? Well, as the black people say, I never let go my faith. I never let go my faith. You know, they've got songs on that. I never let go my faith. And that's why, that's why there's all sorts of these imperfections all over the world. God intervenes in these isolated moments and then we need to do like those black Pentecostals do. I never let go my faith. I never let go my faith. Those guys are right. Those guys are right. They've got the Arminian view, the Wesleyan view, the holiness view. I never let go my faith, right? Sure, we're going to have times where God intervenes. Dreams, visions, voices, impressions, and signs, healings. Even just partial healings, pain relief healings. But I never let go my faith. This is causal thinking, problem-oriented, rather than answer-oriented. It is finished, and yet we awake the eschatological inbreaking, the final resurrection, the life of the age to come. And in the meantime, we're learning to love. The full eschatological outworking of the earth's liberation, already accomplished, once and for all, in the Christ act. Now, <clears throat> C.S. Lewis, I believe is indeed right that the gates of hell are locked from the inside, that our wrong relation to the fire of God's love is in a sense a hell of our own stubborn making. I hate C.S. Lewis's books. I wish everybody would just burn them. In uh, Surprised by Joy, he said pederasty is not a sin. In Mere Christianity, he said Buddhists are probably saved. The guy was a horrible theologian. Throw his stuff out. Read Jonathan Edwards instead. But it is this very flame of love that ultimately cures us from this stubborn delusion. His grace ultimately... Bible, Bible, Bible. Bible, Bible, Bible. 
Bible, 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 Bible. Where is it? Nowhere to be seen. Ultimately proves irresistible, but he indeed does enable our willing synchronicity with him. The image of Christ within us cannot ultimately... Oh, that was a very Wesleyan expression, John. He does enable our willing synchronicity with him. Got my stamp of approval on that statement. The Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following. The Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following. And they went out preaching the word, and the Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following. That's Mark 16. Working with, in the Greek, synergio, where we get the word synergism. Way into nothingness, for it is eternal. And in the meantime, this life that we're living, it's not a litmus test for heaven or hell. It's not a test, but a fall. Wrong. Bible says, uh, that in this life you shall have tribulation, but behold, I have overcome the world. The Bible says, uh, that there are trials. The word trial literally means test. Um, what happens when you go to a court trial? Your life, your, your, guilt, your guiltiness is being put to the test. Right? Trial, test, all this is in the New Testament. Raising children. This is education. This is training. This is pedagogy. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. There is an edu educational element. That's why we... As Wesleyans, we call it scriptural holiness. And the more you read the Bible, the more responsible you are to obey its commands. The more you read the Bible, uh, the more potential you have to be holy if you obey its commands. But if you're just going to read the Bible to study the Bible maps and you're not going to obey its commands, well, you're not going to be better for it. And He seems to give us quite a wide berth for making stubborn, resistant decisions in the process. Yeah, and if you keep it up, you'll go to hell, too. This is a far more Trinitarian view of reality itself. Does our finite capacity for choosing evil have the endurance to outlast his infinite love? Again, Mark 9 says we are all salted with fire. Jesus says this is good. Have it within you. But we who trust in Christ... Come on, is that eternal punishment in a literal fire in the center of the earth? No. Not every time the word fire exists in the Bible, it's talking about hellfire. Come on, John. His faithfulness. Know this fire to be his very faithfulness, and therefore it holds no ill will, no maliciously destructive power over us. I am convinced that his love wins, but it does so in a way that does not override our will. Another universalist heretic from about 10 years ago wrote a book called Love Wins by Rob Bell. Rob Bell, right? He's the one who got this whole thing started. John Crowder's taking the torch and blowing it up into dramatic old school universalism here but rather heals our will, actually frees our will, makes it our own, as McDonald says. A will that rejects him is not one that is free. Now again, this series has been named in honor of George McDonald's famous sermon, The Consuming Fire. And in it he writes that... George McDonald was a heretic, not a serious theologian. Read Jonathan Edwards. He says, Imagination cannot mislead us into too much horror of being without God, for that is living death. But with this divine difference, that the outer darkness is but the most dreadful form of the consuming fire, the fire without light, the darkness visible, the black flame. God hath withdrawn himself, but not lost his hold. 
His face is turned away, but his hand is laid upon him still. His heart has ceased to beat in the man's heart, but he keeps him alive by his fire. And that fire will go on searching and burning in him as the highest saint, who is not yet pure as God is pure. But at length, O God, wilt thou not cast death and hell into the lake of fire, even into thine own consuming self? Then indeed wilt thou be all in all. For then our poor brothers and sisters shall have been burnt clean and brought home for if pure imagination so you're getting this idea that you know everybody goes to hell to be cleaned up and then they go to heaven afterwards and that comes from george mcdonald well at least we know where to lay the blame now ridiculous their would turn heaven for us into hell shall a man be more merciful than god Shall of all his glories God's mercy alone not be infinite? Shall a brother love a brother more than a father loves a son? Would Christ not yet die again to save one brother more? As for us, now we will come to thee, our consuming fire. Thou wilt not burn us more than we can bear, but thou wilt burn us. And although thou seem to slay us, yet we shall trust in thee. So ridiculous. It's ridiculous, pure imagination, and just bizarre. He must have, was he must have uh, inflicted self harm on himself. Doesn't sound like it came from a very mentally stable person. Even for that which thou hast not spoken, if at length we may attain unto the blessedness of those who have not seen and yet have believed. Guys, this is the fire Jesus cast on earth, which he wishes was already kindled. It's the fire of Pentecost. Honestly, John, I don't believe you're a Christian. That's just me. I'd love to be wrong, but I, I think that you're an atheist. And you have no other economic recourse. And you're coming up with the most ridiculous stuff here simply because it's a novelty and people are willing to give you emoji thumbs up thumbs up repent stop it because in the end of the day it doesn't matter what your reputation or what people say or your friends it's the all-seeing eyes of god that go to and fro throughout the earth and those eyes are, are looking at our souls and saying how are you doing with the NIV study bible already poured out on all flesh not all have yet enjoyed the burn so it's all about our orientation to that fire of love. But this fire, because it is divine, because it is freedom itself, is effective to melt the coldest of hearts. This fire is inescapable because it is the inescapable love of God. The very fire of bliss and passion is a fire of torment to others who seek selfish isolation, who reject intimacy, who refuse to hand over their shame and their guilt an unrelenting mercy that will never give them the privacy of an independent health, hellish existence where, where the rocks could cover them up to hide them from his presence. He is everywhere. He is always the good shepherd seeking them out, unrelenting until every knee bows and every tongue confesses the lordship of Jesus Christ. Not for his own narcissism, but for our restoration. Let me close with this. We are saved by grace. This is Christianity 101. So why would God give that grace to some and withhold it from others? Hart writes this. If what the New Testament says about God is true, then it is God's will not to repay us according to our merits, but simply to claim for himself those of his creatures who had been lost in slavery to death. I remain convinced that no one, logically speaking, could merit eternal punishment. But I also accept the obverse claim that no one could merit grace. This does not mean, however, that grace must be rare in order to be truly gracious. 
as so many in the infernalist party so casually assume it does. Grace universally given is still grace. Guys, none of us achieved the healing of our will by our own merit. Why should we think we are the unique special cases? But for all the unbelievers out there, it's up to them. Thomas Talbot says that God's grace is utterly irresistible over the long run now seems to me the best interpretation of Pauline theology. What is your view of grace, John? Is it supernatural? I mean, once you start rejecting fundamentalism, it's kind of like, eh, eh. do you even believe in the supernatural anymore? And you said in, I think, Consuming Fire 3 that you reject fundamentalism. So, I mean, you reject fundamentalism, you reject miracles. What's your view of grace? Is it supernatural grace? Or is this more of a philosophical concept? Majority of theologians in the West have always insisted. He writes, if I am ignorant of or deceived about the true consequences of my choices, then I am in no position to embrace those consequences freely. And if I suffer from an illusion that conceals from me the true nature of God, or the true import of union with God, then I am again in no position to reject him freely. Guys, he is a master surgeon who cures our stubborn, resistant will, our deluded desires, no matter the broken, stubborn determinism to fight against the love of the Father. His love is stronger than our hard-headed resistance. This is... Wesley rejects determinism, and believe it or not, so does Jonathan Edwards. See, you have to understand, Jonathan Edwards, the more you, deeper you get into his Hellfire sermons, uh, which, by the way, that was just a category that he preached. He preached on all sorts of things, science, biology, all sorts of things. But uh, Jonathan Edwards was a Arminian, when you get down to it. And that would offend lots of Presbyterians, Congregationalists, and Baptists to hear me say that. But he was from, he was what you would call a new light theologian. Or in other words, he was breaking away from a lot of this deterministic type of thinking. And that's why John Wesley sometimes referred favorably to Jonathan Edwards. That's why George Whitfield, who was a friend of John Wesley, sometimes teamed up with Jonathan Edwards. They were all in this sort of this grace-enabled free will sort of view. So you're wrong. You're wrong in assuming that Jonathan Edwards was a determinist. He was not. He believed that people were fully responsible for going to hell. ...than our hope. This can be our confidence. MacDonald writes, We do not hope half enough. This is too good to believe, we say. But if there be a God, nothing is too good to believe. And if Christ be his son and messenger and image, humanity is divine and God is human. A father's heart, a heart like our own, only infinite in tenderness will be found at the bottom of things. Well, guys, this was a long one. Bible, Bible, Bible. I mean... He never quoted the Bible, but once or twice, and there were always these all verses, right? That doesn't mean anything. It's practically meaningless, right? Um, so please read your Bibles. And I would, I would point you to um, a book called Hell on Trial by Robert Peterson. It's like the top book on hell ever written in the past 30 years. And... Um, he didn't really go into any of the issues that I thought he was, because I had prepared for some responses. But please do read, on the subject of free will and its relationship to hell, please do read this um, chapter 12, What Difference Does It All Make in uh, Hell on Trial, The Case for Eternal Punishment by Robert Peterson. Because he's going to deal with questions like purgatory. Uh, he's going to deal with the issue of... Uh, what what about what about those who have never heard the gospel? 
He's going to deal with um, uh, what about infants who die or little kids who die before they made professions of Christ. Um, and I, I found out that uh, Westminster Confession um, 10.3 um, says that babies go to heaven. Um, I found that Westminster Confession um, 10.4 um, explains what about those who have never heard the gospel. This is John with WesleyGospel.com.